Ladies, gentlemen, and internet trolls alike, welcome back to Fan Fridays, the show where I give outsiders an inside look into the mind of an MLB All-Star. If you've ever wondered how I watch a game on TV and what I look for, stay tuned, because I got that answer and many more on this very special hotel edition of Fan Fridays. <laughs> All right, I am sitting here in my hotel room doing my Normatec for recovery. I'm about to put my Mark Pro on, but I didn't want to be like hitting myself in the face during Fan Fridays. So this is what we got. We're going to answer some fan questions. And question number one is, the MLB draft class of 2011 could emerge as the best ever. Were you aware of the star talent and overall depth at the time? No, I had absolutely no idea, honestly. Uh, I knew of a couple key names from around the country. I knew Danny Holson. I knew Sonny Gray. Obviously, Garrett and I played it at UCLA together, so I was aware of that. I really didn't know. I didn't. I had no idea who Javier Baez was or Francisco Lindor. Um, I didn't know that Jose Fernandez was in that draft. I didn't know who Mookie Betts was. Like, I didn't know who any of these guys were. I was vaguely familiar with a couple of the key college players, but when I was in college, I was so focused on what was going on at school and with our team that I didn't really pay attention to who – who else was out there? Um, but I mean, looking back at it, we were just having this discussion the other day, actually, like just reading down the list of the first 60 picks is ridiculous. The amount of talent that was in that draft is ridiculous. So I agree. It has a, a large potential to be the best ever. I think uh, a lot of, a lot of superstars in that class. All right. Question number two, what are your thoughts on lack of former pitchers managing in MLB? I understand it in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of times pitchers, they know the game from one side of things, but position players know it from a lot of different angles. Uh, so the learning curve when you jump from being a player, when you jump from being a pitcher as a player to a manager is a lot higher because you have to learn what hitters are thinking. You have to learn what an everyday player you know, thinks and how he feels and the, the flow and all that stuff. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done by any means, but the learning curve is a lot higher. So generally speaking, the best managers are position players and catchers a lot of times because catchers understand a lot of the mentality of the pitchers, but they also understand the mentality of the position players and everybody else. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a lack, a perceived lack of uh, pitchers as managers. Um, also, I think generally speaking, pitchers, they don't share the same type of love I'm not saying that they don't love the game. They don't share the same type of love for the game or the same type of feelings for the game as position players do. Pitchers are a little bit disconnected from the action a lot of times. Like, you go out there, you pitch, but you're not really in it. Like, position players are there every single day, so you learn, like, all the ins and outs, the bunt plays, and the, you know, when's a good time to run, and, like, how do you, all the little, all the little things that a manager needs to know. And man managing is mostly about managing the clubhouse and keeping the morale high and understanding when guys are hot and when they're not, when to give them a day off, when to play them, all this different, you know, all the different stuff. And generally position players are more in tune with that to start off with. So the learning curve's not as high. Question number three, how does a player get chosen to be a team representative and what happens when or if he leaves that team? That's a great question. Uh, every two years, there's a vote. It's a silent vote where, well, first off, people will raise their hand and say, I'd like to be considered. Um, and so you go around the clubhouse. Generally, it happens in the middle of the season. A union representative comes in, says, we're going to take a vote. Who would like to be considered for team uh, alternate or for uh, team rep and alternates? And so if you'd like to be considered, you raise your hand. And generally speaking, there'll be four or five guys that are interested in it. And they'll say, okay, everyone, please, you know, vote for, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the main rep. And so you go around, you write down your name. Who do you want to be the main rep? You write it down on a little piece of paper and you put it in a hat and they tally the votes and they say, okay, the team rep is so-and-so. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it doesn't have to happen that way. Like uh, with the Reds right now, Tucker has been the team rep for a while. And so when, it, when that vote comes around, if Tucker is interested in continuing to do it, then they'll say, is everyone okay with, uh, with Tucker doing it or would you like to have a vote? And generally speaking, the team is okay with it, and he becomes the, you know, the rep because everyone just kind of, yeah, we vote him in without having to take the actual physical vote. But uh, for alternates, basically anyone who would like to become an alternate is, uh, is 
as an alternate and can kind of learn from, from the main team rep and stuff. But it happens every two years. If that player leaves the team, then he goes to a new team, he's no longer an alternate or a team rep there until he gets voted in for it. Now, that's not saying that he's not involved with union stuff. Any player can be as involved or uninvolved as they would like to be, uh, but he's just not officially designated a team rep. Okay, now for some questions from my fans at trevorbauer.com. I appreciate all of you guys. Question number four uh, comes from Augie Levin. Uh, and he says, as a pitcher, what is the best thing for a catcher to tell you when you're having a bad inning? And it really depends on why you're having a bad inning. I mean, sometimes a catcher can come out there and crack a joke because if you're stressed and you're like, oh, and you're like in your head and a catcher comes out there and tells a joke, it like, it catches you off guard and it breaks whatever rhythm's going on. I think a lot of fans have the impression that when a pitching coach goes to the mound or a catcher goes to the mound, they're giving advice to the pitcher. They're, they're telling him, hey, your delivery's off like this or the, whatever the case is. That's oftentimes not the case. Uh, it's strictly to break the rhythm. Like maybe you've thrown seven balls in a row or eight balls in a row and like you're just, the wheels are spinning a little bit out there. Um, so the catcher will go out and say, hey, bud, you know, let's get ahead of this guy. Uh, make him hit it. Make him beat you. Like, how you doing? You all right? Like, did you watch that show last night? All right, let's get him. And it's just to kind of, like, get your mind off it and break the timing and the rhythm and stuff like that. A lot of times pitching coaches the same thing. One of the worst things you can do is go out to the mound and tell a pitcher, hey, your, your glove side isn't doing this or that or the other. and Because then the pitcher starts thinking about that instead of, you know, and that well, that's a narrow internal mindset, and then it just makes the performance worse. So, um, yeah, it's 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 hard. You have to know as a catcher, you have to know the personality of the pitcher, and you have to know why they're struggling. Are they struggling because they're in their head, or are they like not thinking enough and they're throwing stupid pitches? Um, are they mad about a play that wasn't made, or about a call that the umpire missed, or something like that? So it's just it's variable. You gotta you gotta kind of understand the flow of the game and. Uh, and, and the personality of the pitcher. Question number five comes from Ryan Kucher, who says, what is the most difficult aspect of your preparation and routine while on the road, and how do you combat those difficulties? That's another good question. A lot of the stuff I do in the weight room, we don't necessarily have on the road. Weight rooms on the road are very small, uh, so you don't have the same types of machines or the same types of cardio equipment. Um, everything else is like fairly consistent, except for stuff like this. Uh, where I'm sitting here doing my recovery in the hotel room. Um, sometimes it's harder to bring stuff like this along. Um, stuff at home that I have, I have my like personal sauna, my little, uh, you know, like personal sauna, I guess, in my, in my hotel room, and I have my red light panel. So I can't really do those on the road because it's really hard to travel with those. So that's probably the only thing I really can't do. Uh, and then sometimes in the weight room, you have to get kind of creative to get the same exercises that you would normally do in while you're on the road. Question number six uh, comes from Marianne Sisney, and who says, why do some of the most dominant pitchers in baseball struggle against one specific team in their career? Uh, well, it's mainly a mindset, I think, of the team that they struggle against. Like, the pitcher knows that they have bad outings against a certain team, and the team knows that that pitcher is good but has bad outings against them. And so you get... A team that's like, we have success off this guy, and he's really good, so like we're going to get him, and they're, they're like excited for it. And you have a pitcher that's like, I hate pitching against these guys, and so he's kind of like down a little bit. So what you see is a team that may not be elite, like bumps up a level, and the pitcher that might be elite bumps down a little bit of level, a, a, one, or, one or two levels, just mentality-wise, uh, and then that evens the playing field a little bit. Um, oftentimes, too, like a team just has a bunch of guys that like, a team philosophy of hitting that a certain pitcher type struggles against. Like if I throw high four seams and curveballs, uh, but the team I'm hitting against is really good at hitting sinkers and sliders, I'm probably going to have good success. But if I throw high, if I throw sinkers and sliders to that team, like, and they have a bunch of hitters that train in that methodology and, and adopt that approach, like it's going to be a tough day for me, even though that might not be the case against every other team in the league. So uh, it's matchup dependent, it's mentality dependent, um, and sometimes it's just <laughs> the luck of the draw. Like, there's no real reason why it just thinks things happen in certain order, and it, yeah. So, so sometimes it's, you can, you can tell why, sometimes you can't. Uh, last but not least, question number seven from Matt Ritchie, who says, 
Uh, when you pitch or when you watch a game on TV for fun, if you even do, what do you look at? Well, I don't watch a ton of games on TV strictly because most of the games that happen during the year are going on while I'm watching the game that we're playing. Uh, I'll watch postseason baseball if we're not in the postseason because I, there's nothing, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm not playing. So uh, when I watch that, though, I'm, I'm usually watching the sequencing uh, of the pitcher um, and trying to understand, like, what he's trying to do, and I find that to be pretty interesting. Uh, and I like to watch trends a lot, like, over a course of a series where you have a, the same pitcher pitching against a specific team multiple times in a, in a given number of days, a set number of days. So... Generally, it's like, okay, the pitcher is a fastball, curveball, changeup guy, but if you throw fastballs, curveballs, and changeups in the same sequence the first game as you do in game four, as you do in game seven, like the hitters get a lot better. So I like to see hitter adjustments. I like to watch how pitchers adjust, whether they just flip it and they're like their fastball first and breaking ball to finish early, and then their breaking ball early and fastball to finish late, or if they start away and they move in, or if they're, you know, all over the map, you know, mixing everything up the entire game, well, then what do you do the next time? Is it you just think it's, you know, uh, variable enough that they're not going to catch on to any sort of pattern, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of things like that, specifically with the pitching that I like to, that I like to watch, but that includes the hitters. Uh, and then it's just the moment, you know, the atmosphere the moment is someone going to make a big play at a big time stuff like that so that's what i enjoy watching uh all right so that's questions uh from you guys and now i have a question for you if every team can't play 60 games this year because of covid delays rain delays whatever the case is they can't get them in how's mlb going to decide who's a playoff team what do you think they should do win percentage overall wins head to head like, how are we going to decide? I have no clue. I don't think anyone has any idea. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you'd like a shout out in a future video, head on over to trevorbauer.com, sign up for my email list, and submit your question on the homepage. I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2020, so if you could do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, if you haven't already, that would be great. And I will see you guys in the next video. Have a fantastic day.